Okay, so this talk is on AngularJS. Um, I have no notes, so this is all going to be from my head. So if I get something wrong, I do apologize. So this talk is around kind of security. Okay. This talk is around uh, security, but um, I'll just introduce who I am first. So I'm Louis Ardern. I'm a PhD candidate at Leeds Beckett University looking at browser security, mainly around how to isolate JavaScript. Um, I used to work at Sigital, but since being acquired, uh, from Synopsis, I now work as a security consultant at Synopsis. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Lewis Arden. And the research interests are browser security, JavaScript, HTML5, and static analysis. So this talk has a lot of content, so I'm going to just try and get through AngularJS in a nutshell very quickly and then move on to the actual good parts. So does anyone actually know, uh, has anyone actually built a, not built an AngularJS application or knows what it is? Okay. I know you're lying, but <laughs> so AngularJS in a nutshell. So AngularJS is an open source um, framework. It's a JavaScript framework on the client side. It's maintained by Google. Now, there's two versions of AngularJS. There's Angular, which is the new Angular version that was released, and, and there's also AngularJS. So AngularJS is currently on 1.6.5, and this was the first release back in 2009, 2010. Angular um, 2 was released, and then they just skipped 3, and now we're on Angular 4.3.0. Um, it's on the, the basis of an MVC framework, so it's model view controller. Um, there's also the model view um, view model, which is kind of like the, um, the view uh, is the scope, and that's the definition of uh, the model. Uh, but uh, in the world of AngularJS, there's also this concept of model view whatever, so you know, whatever it means to you. So there's also um, you know, services, factories, and all these different wonderful things in AngularJS, um, so it doesn't really matter if it's controlled or not. It was originally developed by Misko Heavery and then open sourced and maintained by Google. And the benefits for AngularJS is that it separates you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript logic. Uh, and it you know, offers convenience with DOM manipulations because it has these directives such as like on-click events, so like ng click and so on. And it's also quite fast. You know, it's quite fast. It's a single page application. It's generally used for single page applications, so you get fluid experience through like deep embedded links by you know, clicking through it without actually seeing the page change in many different ways. And we briefly talked about the OWASP top 10 uh, in Sam's talk. Um, but when you think about AngularJS when it comes to OWASP, um, you generally wouldn't think it's about injection, because this is more about SQL injection or command injection or XML injection. However, AngularJS has expressions on the client side, and these are generally defined by the scope object. And if you can inject you know, client-side code, you can actually interact with these scope objects, which might perform client-side interactions to the server. So it's kind of like an injection. Broken authentication and session management is a truly server-side implementation. It's always going to be on the server side, so it's not applicable to AngularJS. Cross-site scripting, of course, because you know, that's what it is. It's JavaScript, and that's generally the ability to inject and you know, manipulate JavaScript code. Indirect um, object resource, again, references. That's, again, more of a server-side issue because you're trying to access objects that, you know, that you're not intended to access, and that's always a server-side implementation. Now, security misconfiguration is definitely a problem because Angular has the ability to configure things, and you can you know, do client-side routing wrong. You can also turn off security features, so it's definitely a problem. Also, sensitive data exposure. Again, I would say this um, is definitely a problem. So for example, there's also this idea when you start to build um, client-side applications that there's this implicit client-side trust. So essentially, you might think that you're returning the user object just to contain the name. But if you start building things like you know, using MongoDB with Express, you find out quite quickly that you know, sometimes the entire user object gets returned and it gets stored in local storage. So it's definitely a problem. There's also sensitive data exposure, oh, which I just mentioned. Uh, but there's, when I talk about missing functional level access control, this is a server-side problem. But with AngularJS, there's actually you know, ng-show and ng-hide that you're using to kind of show and hide the application. Of course, this is a client-side problem, but again, with the client-side trust part where people tend to start to move to the client of security, uh, it becomes quite a huge problem, so it's kind of an issue. And again, CSER, this is more of a server-side interaction but uh, it's still an issue, but AngularJS actually offers some um, lack or some kind of help when it comes to that problem. <laughs> Unknown components with known vulnerabilities. There's, um, my internet is unstable, supposedly, but uh, 
There are unknown components with known vulnerabilities. Again, this is true because we have third party libraries that we integrate. And if they have contained vulnerabilities, uh, that's true. And also, unvalidated, unvalidated redirects and forwards is also a problem because there's a dollar location service in AngularJS, which allows you to manipulate the client side and use you know, the, the location.href to modify where you want to go. So now we're going to talk around AngularJS security protections. So AngularJS is quite good when it comes to actually offering security out, out, out of the box. It offers you know, output encoding by default. So if you think of expressions with curly braces, uh, or ng bind, it automatically outputs and code that data. So if you try to include like a on mouse over then as you can see on the slide, it's not going to work because it's automatically output encoded. It also offers HTML sanitization. Now, in the early versions of AngularJS, before what, before strict contextual escaping was introduced, and um, there was this ng bind HTML unsafe directive, and this allowed you to explicitly whitelist white, white data. And before that, it would automatically sanitize the data. So that was the only way to trust, um, explicitly trust data in an AngularJS way. But then once 1.2 came along, there was the strict contextual escaping, which basically does HTML sanitization, and it's contextually aware. So you can define it for HTML, CSS, URL, and so on. But when we think about ng bind HTML, and this is when you display HTML to the view, um, this only works with SE trust as HTML. But Developers tend to use directives, uh, or create their custom directives, and then they use the SE trust as CSS URL and so on in their own way, which can also introduce vulnerabilities. So in the configuration, there's this thing called the SC provider. And if you ever see this turned off, it's a huge red flag, and you should definitely be reporting, reporting this to your team, creating a JIRA ticket because it shouldn't be there. Because once you then in, add things to ng bind HTML, it automatically will display you know, the, the, the HTML markup as, as it is with no sanitization. Um, and uh, yeah, again, there's also SCE trust as, you know, but they're generally used for custom directives. So when we think about AngularJS as well, there's also protections for um, the content security policy. Now the CSP is this server side um, header, sorry, uh, the HTTP header, or response header that defines you know, what resources are allowed to be loaded on your page. And, it's, and AngularJS by default harmonizes with CSP. It doesn't use um, eval, eval by default. It doesn't use inline scripts. Uh, when you use CSP, these are automatically blocked. But you know, CSP is configurable, and so is AngularJS with CSP. So Angular, as we said before, separates HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which means there's no inline scripts, which means it's actually fine by default. You know, you can use it out of the box. Shouldn't give you too much of a problem, but from what I've heard from a lot of developers, it's quite still a massive pain. There are a few caveats. So when AngularJS first wants to pass expressions, it calls a new function, which is you know, um, a dynamic execution of JavaScript, and this will be blocked. But it does have a workaround, and it will automatically try and process it in a different way, but it will lower uh, the actual performance by about 30% when you process expressions. And Angular also uses, um, tries to use, it can use inline styles, but not inline scripts for ng cloak and ng hide. So this is also a problem, and you would have to allow, you know, an actual bad directive within CSP to allow it to execute. Um, so as, I, as um, you can see here on the page, this is generally what it would look like. So when, I, when you want to bind Angular to a page, you would define it on a, either the body or a paragraph tag or something like that, and you would define it with ng app. But then if you want to include CSP, you would use ng app with ng CSP. And then if you actually wanted to not um, allow unsafe eval, but allow inline styles, you would allow no safe inline. And again, if you wanted to allow inline, so no inline, but allow eval, then you would do it, do it separately. However, when you think about allowing um, you know, styles in your application, there is a wonderful paper by Mario Hedrich that actually defines that, which you can't really see the link from here because it's a bit broken, but that's fine. <laughs> you can see it on the screen on the recording, and I, um, the slides will be online afterwards. Um, it's actually about scriptless attacks. So with um, doing JavaScript execution through CSS, generally through like things like background URL, which only really worked in Internet Explorer, but you technically can bring back IE9 from the dead, so it's, it's still a problem if you use like a meta tag and add the comp compatibility mode. 
So instead of allowing unsafe inline, or they could have used CSTONG, which allows you to generate CSS with JavaScript, you can just include a CSS file into your page from the AngularJS website, and then you actually don't have to include the bad directives from CSP. But you know, there is no silver bullet when it comes to security, and it also is the same when it comes to um, uh, the content security policy. There are numerous bypasses. Um, so if we take a look at this example, um, assume that we've got an application with ng app and ng csp. If someone is able to inject arbitrary HTML into the page, they then can actually um, abuse Angular's features to um, execute JavaScript. Now, I'm pretty sure there's easier ways if you can inject this much HTML into the page to find cross-site scripting, uh, even with CSP, but um, it actually abuses the Angular features, if, especially if it uses like strict dynamic or explicitly whitelist uh, the CSP, uh, the CSP in, uh, in the script source. And there's a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful example, like tons of bypasses by Sebastian Likas, who works at Google, and it's a, you know, a ton of different things. It's not just for AngularJS, it's for VanillaJS. Uh, it's also um, you know, browser-specific ones, along with things like Polymer and you know, Ember, for example. So there was also this thing called the Angular Sandbox. And it technically um, wasn't really a sandbox, but all versions, well, not all of them, after 1.x, I can't remember the version off the top of my head, uh, there was a sandbox that essentially, the reason why AngularJS did, the AngularJS team did this was to move you away from the DOM because it's a complex mess. They wanted to you know, allow you to use your own directives and then build custom directives on top of that. So they just moved you away from the DOM and you would generally be ac accessing things through scrape objects, which is how you represent things to the view. However, there was a team of researchers, the first sandbox bypass was found by uh, Mario Hedrich, uh, where you were able to essentially create two curly braces and add the constructor and add its function constructor, and you had full access to execute any arbitrary JavaScript that you wanted. But then they fixed it, and then they got a bit more complex. So what does it mean to escape the sandbox? It means to directly you know, manipulate the document object model and you know, just to execute plain arbitrary JavaScript. And the example here is you're creating like a constructor with a prototype. You're essentially overriding char app, uh, which AngularJS uses internally to process it to see if things are bad or you know, they shouldn't actually be there, do the pipe checking. Uh, and then it basically joined everything together. It used an Angular feature, which is called dollar eval that I'll talk about later. And then you could execute the arbitrary JavaScript again. And there's a great um, blog by Gareth Hayes that um, essentially discusses all of this in very much detail. And as I said before, the, 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 the true problem was it wasn't that the sandbox existed. It was about that developers were introducing vulnerabilities where you were able to inject arbitrary expressions into the page, which shouldn't have happened in the first place. So uh, Synopsis also have a great blog on this as well. It was written by David Johansson. It's a very good blog. I wrote like two things and I got credit for it. So anyway, <laughs> there's also a wonderful playlist by Live Overflow. Um, and it goes through different kinds of, it first explains the AngularJS framework. It goes into detail about different kinds of sandbox escapes and how it works with like debugging. It's a phenomenal resource if you do want to check out how this works under the hood. There's also cross-site request forgery protection. So it offers help. So if you think that you've just set up your server-side implementation and you want to make sure that it's being sent as a header because this does prevent a lot of CSERF attacks because they'll first have to exploit that you know, grab the CSERF token and append it into the header and it might be blocked in many ways. So Angular automatically appends it when it sees the XSRF token. Um, so what a developer would need to do is to securely generate this token you know, on the server side, append it to the XSRF token uh, as a cookie. And of course you can't include HTTP only. So if developers start to get this in the pen test reports, it's fine, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's, it is a, an issue, but it's not, so anyway. So um, then you want to verify, and Angular automatically converts this into the XS, XSRF token, and it matches the token with the cookie value. Uh, and then obviously, if the server's happy with this, it will go, yep, yeah, great, and perform the request, otherwise it will reject it. And it's also configurable. So in the configuration of AngularJS, so if you do that like angular.config, uh, you can define uh, the HTTP XSRF header name. So even if your current middleware supports a different name, you can configure it to whatever you want. Oh. Someone's hacked me, it seems. Um, okay. Oh, it's auto trying to connect to Zoom now. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I think I might have lost connection. Someone made it. <laughs> um, Sorry? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I'll try and reconnect. Hmm. So I've been deauth and it wants me to re add the token. Yep, well, it, it wants me to reconnect and I don't trust any of you guys at the back. So uh, I will set up my own hotspot and we'll go from there. Um, No, it's, it's trying to ask me for the password, so I'll just set up my own VPN. Huh? That's fine. Yeah, I'll Sorry, one second. Okay. Well, so, no, I'm connected to my phone now. It's fine. Um, but now, uh, I've lost... I have internet now, so that's good. Um, I'll try and reconnect to the thing during the meeting. Ah. ah. Do you have the link? Yes. Technical issues, guys. It's okay. Um, you might want to get a beer, you know, while we're waiting, but um. Just need the meeting ID, right? Yeah. 963 232582. Two, 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 Yeah, so you might need to give me um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's working now. Oh. <laughs> I don't trust these guys. <laughs> yes, that's me. Yeah. Oh. I was rejoining that's why. Okay. So uh, guys, it's, it's back up, so uh, we might want to go back on with the presentation. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, okay. Okay, so we're going to get back to it, guys. Okay. Okay, we're good to go. So if you want to sit back down, I know, well, you know, it's fine. So I'll carry on. So. We first talked about what AngularJS offers as security protections, and it's quite you know, fantastic in many ways because it offers automatic uh, HTML sanitization and output encoding, that's pretty badass. So now I'm gonna move on to the AngularJS security issues, so actual implementation issues that developers will tend to be using. So when you want to load templates in AngularJS, by default it has some quite same defaults. It just allows it to load from the current origin um, along with the correct protocol. Um, but when you think of template URLs, uh, they're generally used for routing, directives, things like ng source and ng include when you want to include some third party data or different pages into your application. So, as I, as I said before, uh, it offers uh, default resources are restricted from the same domain and protocol. Um, but if you want to load um, third party applications, you have to modify the configuration file. And this can be done insecurely. Uh, and you can do this by whitelisting or blacklisting the URLs, depending on if you want to allow or deny certain either URLs, directories, and so on in your application. So to allow the problem of developers to actually load external resources, you can modify the configuration file and use the SC delegate provider. And this allows you to de define resource URL whitelists. As you can see here, 
this is quite a verbose, uh, insecure wildcard that would allow resources being loaded from any domain. Now, you, know, you definitely don't want to do this because if someone has the ability to define what's being loaded, then they might be able to trick someone to load ex you know, ex external resources into the page. And if you're using things like ng source or ng includes, if you try and do script alert one in there, it's not going to work. So you'd have to write AngularJS expressions in those HTML files. And then the second one, if you take a look at it again, it's loading a very insecure scheme. So the HTTP um, protocol, it's allowing any subdomain from example.com and it's allowing any, any directory. So again, that's a very bad and you definitely shouldn't be doing it. Um, but the actual way to do this um, securely would be to one, configure the specific protocol and domains or subdomains that you trust. You know, you definitely don't want to allow JavaScript uh, URIs. Um, so you know, never, double, never use a double asterisk to allow arbitrary domains or protocols because it's going to, any kind of vulnerability that exists on any of those subdomains might be able to be used in your application. Uh, and you know, if you think of like CSP, if you, you know, allow a very verbose um, CSP policy from a CDN, there's loads of things on that CDN that could use to compromise you. And you, know, you should never use the double asterisk as part of the domain or protocol because again, you can allow things like JavaScript URIs, which you definitely don't want to do. And you know, it can be any URL you know, that is specified if it's controllable by the user. And if you think of a blacklist, um, it basically is the, the last step of the puzzle. So uh, if you realize that, for example, your AngularJS application is relatively secure, but someone's reported an open redirect in one of your um, directories, uh, with a, you know, and you can include a query parameter, you actually can use the blacklist in the SE delegate provider to define that you don't want it to go to that individual resource. So there's also open redirect. So as I mentioned before, there's a dollar window. Uh, the dollar, win dollar window off has the ability to access the location, which means you can define the href of where you want to go. Uh, so it allows developers to read and write the current browser's location, and it also exposes the API. So the location API is a raw object that can be modified directly. And of course, an attacker can abuse this by adding the JavaScript URI, um, or um, just taking, telling you to go to a very vulnerable um, third party attacker.com or evil.com. And the way you'd actually fix this, so in, instead of allowing you know, just anyone to define the URL, you would either um, just do a hard coded URL, that sounds pretty good, or you can add a whitelist of accepted URLs, or my personal favorite, use indirect reference maps, so just define you, know, you want to go to welcome, you want to go to home, and that's all you can really do. And of course, if it's not inside the dictionary, just reject it. And if absolute URLs do need to be defined because it's a requirement in your, you know, your, your specs, you can just you know, you know, make sure you do like a pattern to validate the scheme. So I'm gonna try and do a live demo and hopefully I don't get kicked off again. And luckily with AngularJS, it's all local, so that's pretty fun. Um, okay, so um, if you take a look at the current application that I have, uh, you've got a go-to parameter that's including example.com. And if I try and log in as anyone, it's gonna just return back. So think of it as a Node.js on the back end. All it's doing is sending the server, sending a response. And on a, on a returned response, it then goes away. So as you can see, we've got the open redirect. And of course, you can also do JavaScript URIs. So, oh, yeah, I've got to log in. So test and test. And again, you've got your cross-set scripting. So the way to remediate this, and I'm gonna try and show you some code. So like using an indirect map. So again, I define that I, you know, even though we used example.com as the, uh, the example, you know, it's not a good representation, but you know, if I want to define welcome.html welcome and example.com, I can create a dictionary. And then I can basically do, um, and I'll, I'll show you, first show you the code. So what it's doing is uh, it's going to the location service and it's searching for go to. And as you, know, you saw here, that's what we're using as the parameter. And then you know, if there's no redirect URL, it just defines a welcome.html. And then later in the code, uh, we're doing a $HTTP, which sends a request to the server. And on the response, we dot then, we're defining the window location as the redirect URL, essentially. So what we can then do is uh, allow the dictionary. So if we save this and try and do JavaScript alert one, it's not gonna work anymore because it's not valid. It just goes to the welcome.html, uh, but if I want to go to example.com, I can define the map here and then just you know, do test and test and then log in, and I still go to example.com. So that's the one way to remediate it. But there's obviously, as I said, 
a few more examples. There's also expression injection. So I mentioned earlier that even though we have things like SQL injection and XML, they're generally more damaging, there's also expression injection. And this generally happens because developers are porting AngularJS over to, from, from in, inside JSP code, for example, and they're still doing interpolation on, on, the, on the page. So uh, when you think about AngularJS, it's a client-side framework, and you know, the pages should be static in, you know, for most of the time, if you can. So if you mix client and server-side templates, uh, if you think about server-side templates in general, they try to do output encoding. But Angular expressions are not, out, you know, are not HTML special characters, therefore they don't abide to by the encoding. So if you have the ability to inject user input into the page, um, it's only going to escape the greater than less, you know, greater than less than quote, double quote. Um, so it won't, it won't escape the Angular code, it will then be rendered into the, you know, the view engine, and Angular will process that. So where possible, avoid using client-side and server-side templates, keep the, the application logic and server logic completely separate if you can. So I'm gonna show you an example of what it would kind of look like from an attack perspective. And if you have Burp Sweep, it automatically looks for this now, so you'll probably get a nice bounty if you find it. So um, think about we're sending, you know, uh, curly brace, curly brace, uh, two plus one. Uh, into you know the you know, the server's going to look at that and go it's fine the rendering engine is not going to encode it because it's not HTML special characters and then it gets you know only HTML special characters are encoded and then it gets added to the Angular page it's going to get returned back and then processed by Angular later and then it gets sent over you know as I said like Angular JS expressions are written to the page and I'm going to send it over to the templating engine and Angular is going to go through and pass it all go yep oh there's a, an expression I need to process and then it goes to the view. And then the mission is, you know, one plus two will convert into two because that's what you know, expressions are done in AngularJS. So the way to remediate this uh, is to, where possible, you know, it's not always possible, is to rewrite Angular templates to purely only AngularJS. And if you really need to, you know, get data displayed to the view, just assign it to a scope object and display it through ng-bind, ng-bind HTML or through an expression, but not, you know, as user input. Uh, you also then want to try and reduce the scope, ad, the scope of um, an Angular. So if you do ng-app on your full HTML body, then that's entirely Angularified. So if you can define it only for the parts you need, so including it on a parameter or a divider, as we see in the example, then only that divider is Angularified. So if you did have an expression going in it later, and it was encoding everything, at least in our special characters, it'd be fine. But if you realize that you, you know, your team says we're not going to do this, you can just use the ng non bindable directive. And what this tells Angular, it tells Angular not to process it as an Angular expression. And of course, if you can, you, know, you can sanitize your untrusted input to remove curly braces or whatever you define in the configuration setting. Um, they generally tell you to use escaping on the Angular documentation, so that's also another way. And of course, um, if an attacker has the ability to inject HTML markup, everything that I just said is null and void. So uh, <laughs> just keep that in mind. So I've got a video recorded because I don't trust myself doing this one. Um, so this is um, an application. It's not using a server-side template. It's using jQuery. It's using dot .text, but it's meant to be treating it as text, but we'll see the vulnerability soon. So I'm going to log in as Bob and obviously try the password as password, but that's a vulnerability that's showing the password. So I tried to log in as Bob and it failed. I'm gonna try script alert one. And again, it's not going to work, it will just treat it as text. Now, if I do try and do one plus one, it's then gonna treat it as an Angular expression and process that into two, as you can see here. So now we know that, um, that we're using like the latest version, so 1.6. And there's no sandbox, so there's no sandbox, re sandbox request, re yeah, sandbox escape required. So we're just going to do constructor, call it function constructor, and then make an alert box pop up. So as you can see, access, success. Now, we're going to go away and remediate this using one of the things I spoke about earlier. So we're going to take a look at the code, and as you can see, it's bound with Angular, so it's Angularified on the body. We're using um, the parameter tag with the ID of message, and we're using jQuery to update that when we get the response from the server. So as you can see here, so if the parameter user exists, it goes, you know, if it failed to authenticate, then it's going to just return that back in jQuery.txt. Um, now the way to fix this is, of course, it's being assigned to the, the message ID, the parameter. So we're just going to include ng non-bindable for this. 
So now, you know, the, I think something that was vulnerable is no longer going to be vulnerable because we've defined it as an um, Angular will no longer process this. So we tried the payload again. It's just going to treat it as text. So that's one way to do it. All right. Okay, so that's expression injection. And now we move on to the more fun things, which generally people don't think about. Uh, is you know, Angular expressions are you know snippets of code, and they can be executed through various methods in Angular. So you can evaluate you know expressions with Angular JS using dollar eval, for example. You can order this data through um, expressions as well. So if you want to order a list, you can do that through Angular. And Angular JS can also pass expressions, and I'll go more into that soon. So we have something called the scope, and as I mentioned before, this is how you just define data to review. So on scope methods, you have you know, eval, and in Douglas Crawford's uh, you know, JavaScript, the good parts, he mentions how eval is evil, and it's no different in AngularJS. So if you can include arbitrary user input into the expression uh, as, as, as defined in red, you have full access uh, to execute arbitrary JavaScript, even if there was in this, you know, 1.5.9, which is technically meant to be the most secure because the sandbox is ridiculous. It was actually pretty secure, but someone, I think it was Matthias Carlson who broke it, but that might be wrong. Uh, then, of course, there's dollar apply, which basically is used to define. Um, so, if it's outside the Angular scope, you normally use apply to bring it back to a full cycle. And of course, you know you want to watch collections for when things change. There's also order by. So, this is how you order things within um, inside Angular. So, you can either do it by just defining a pipe on side the actual expression itself, or you can use the dollar filter with order by or you can actually just define it inside the function itself. And of course, there's internal services, and these aren't generally exposed to developers, but you can use them if you need to, where you can use mostly everything on, as we see, um, I was gonna do the little thing, but everything on the scope method at some point calls, calls pass. So that's the reason why it's vulnerable. Oh, oh, uh, nice. Oh, anyway, pew pew. So, <laughs> so there's a fantastic um, blog by Gareth Hayes that talks about DOM-based AngularJS sandbox escapes, and he's going to be speaking about it soon. But essentially, when you're inside order by, you're not inside a scope object. Um, and if I have my notes, I can explain you the full reason why, but I'm not going to do it. But what, read his blog, it's phenomenal. Um, so essentially, it's not inside a scope object, and a lot of the later sandboxes required uh, the ability to um, call dollar $eval, which is an Angular, Angular feature inside the scope. Um, so you had to find a, a unique way of bypassing the sandbox, and it was, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. So the way to remediate this, uh, you know, if possible, avoid using user input to create expressions. And if user input does need to be used in expressions, only treat it as data rather than the code itself. So as you can see in this example, we're calling scope dollar eval async, and we're saying dollar dot result equals to hello, which is a string, along with scope dot user input with another string. So that's then treated as data rather than code, and it won't execute the expression as, as such. And then of course, if you um, need to evaluate it as part of expression code, you must do strict input validation. So you, know, you would call something like, you know, uh, make sure the, uh, the scope frames is not undefined, and then you would call the own property and just check to see uh, if it exists inside um, you know, your, your defined list. So I'm gonna show you another example. Um, which uh, is the vulnerable first. So what we're doing here is that we're calling the, an order by filter, and essentially we're defining from user data. So when the, this user data comes in, um, it then basically calls a, um, yeah, as you can see in the ng repeat here, we've got friends and friends, and it's taking it from the user data. So now if we go to the example, um, I've already populated this, so well, there's one thing to note. So Burp Suite, for example, will find client-side, server-side template injection, but it won't find this because I'm not using curly braces. All I'm doing, I'm already inside a scope object, so it's all on the client, and you know, so if I populate it with constructor.constructor and alert, and then uh, short the table, and it's gonna pop up a few times, it's going through the list one by one by one by one. So, uh, so it's definitely one way to do it. Now, if we take a look at the actual fix, of course, all I'm doing here um, is, where is it? So I'm basically just grabbing, you know, is it of age, phone number, or name, and then doing an index of making sure it's there, and then it will assign it to the user data. Oh, that's broken that. So if I go to the secure example and try and do the exact same payload and sort the table, it's not going to work because it's not inside the list. Okay. 
So I know I might be going over time, but there's also Angular Element. So Angular Element is a subset of jQuery, and um, it allows you to still access some of jQuery's features. So if user input is indirectly added to, you know, after append and so on, you can execute arbitrary JavaScript. So as a developer, you really need to validate the input before sending it to any of these functions, and you can do it with internal Angular features through SC trust, get trusted HTML or dollar sanitize. Oh, that did not go the way I wanted it to. Uh, okay. So if we take a look at this current example, um, we're reading data from the user and it's sending, ng model is the way to do two-way data, data binding in AngularJS. So we're sending that as an after submit function. And then later we're then appending the scope after data, which is the two-way data binds into element after, and you essentially would get your cross-site scripting. And you know, why is there an injection? Because it's not doing strict intention escaping, it's, it's treating as arbitrary HTML or markup. Now I'm moving on to third-party library security issues. So you know, as um, you know, developers, we want to really enhance our applications, and one way to do that is, is including third-party libraries. But there's always a risk using third-party code, and AngularJS libraries are no different. You know, they're using JavaScript, it's a weird and wonderful quirky language with lots of different pitfalls and sources and sinks. And so when you're incorporating these libraries into your application, you should review the GitHub list issue list to see if there's any reported cross-site scripting or you know, security issues. Use open source um, libraries, or sorry, frameworks such as ESLint with the ScanJS rules plugin. Uh, try and identify components with known vulnerabilities using RetireJS or SNC um, because well, you know, they have command line tools, you can run them. And, uh, and they also have now browser implementations, and they, you know, one's a burp sweep plugin and zap plugin and so on. And of course, you can use uh, glue closure detect that looks for DOM based cross site scripting, and you can also manually review the code. It's very time consuming, especially when it's not your code that you've written. So, this is a third party library. So, Angular Translate is offering internationalization, and by default, it offers no translation strategy. And when there's a translation strategy, it essentially isn't doing any kind of escaping or encoding or so on. So if you can find uh, you know, an application that isn't applying a strategy, it will automatically be vulnerable. So as you can see here, we're including um, arbitrary JavaScript into the expression and it's being processed by you know, Angular Translate and then actually executing the JavaScript. There's also a text Angular. So text Angular is a what you see is what you get editor. It allows for rich HTML markup. Um, but Text Angular uses its own sanitizer, so it uses the Text Angular sanitize module, and it, all it's doing is verifying that you know, it's either HTTP and that the string is then encoded on the server, but when it's returned back to the view, it's an unencoded and treated as arbitrary JavaScript. Sorry, HTML, whatever. So if you take a look at the sample payloads, you just include HTTP, you know, AA, and then your alert and your payloads, you can then um, you know, enter it and it will be rendered as this. And then, of course, when that's rendered back to the view, you know, you have your cross-site script. Again. There's also XSS and type A head, and this has two problems. So in the early versions, um, it wasn't using, it was using ng bind HTML unsafe. As I mentioned before, it's in, this is deprecated now, but they were still using it, and it, that was automatically trusting HTML. But then, if you don't include the ng sanitize module as well, it automatically will still not be escaping the code. So that also, so if you take a look at this example, all we're doing is in the type A head, we're doing a, an iterative list around searches and assigning it in the search value. And of course, if you can include user input in here, it's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So I look to the future. So we have two and four now. And of course, it's very difficult to write complex but secure applications. It's always gonna get, you know, vulnerabilities get introduced. I write terrible code all the time and people slap me. So, um, you know, Angular 1 contained many vulnerable features and it introduced a lot of security problems. But the Angular 2 attack surface is quite a lot smaller and quite significantly different. So they rewrote the entire framework. It's no longer using, it's doing unidirectional data binding rather than going to the scope, going to the root scope, heading over to the controller and being processed. It's now unidirectional directly to the, to the elements. So it has interpolation, one way and two way data binding and event binding. Which means when they rewrote the entire framework, they got rid of all the watchers, apply, compile, interpolate, and so on. And the, some of the vulnerable features weren't even introduced. They were saying this caused security problems, well, you know, problematic issues, so we got rid of it. So there's no more order by pipe. And with ECMAScript 6, you don't even need dollar eval because you can just use template strings. 
So again, it has encoding and sanitization by default. It harmonizes with the CSP, and it even has better naming conventions. So you know, bypass security, trust HTML, and no one wants to put that in their code. If you take a look at the Facebook uh, React code, it like, literally says you will be fired. So there's, so there's some really weird things in the React code. And there's also build time security. So it does an um, ahead of time compilation rather than just in time. So you're building, you know, you're compiling your static pages before it even goes to the page. And that it should reduce the actual attack surface of expression injection because it still exists in Angular, Angular 2 and 4. So it's important to know it is a client side framework. The production flag can be disabled, which there's plugins in your browser, or not plugins, extensions in your browser that allow you to modify scrape objects and different sort of Batarang and augury. This can be this this didn't get enabled in the JavaScript, and then you can't use these anymore. But then I can just capture the response and just remove it. So um, it's it's not uh, it, it's a security protection, but it's not. Uh, client elements can be modified. So if you have ng show and ng hide or route guards, which are boolean. You can just you know, satisfy their needs, and then you can get access to potential things that you shouldn't be able to see. Sensitive data can be retrieved from local storage and session storage, so don't store you know, as much information, as little as possible, and where possible, use session storage because it gets, you know, it gets removed. Local storage is persistent. And security should always be enforced on the server. So even though we're saying like, it offers all these protections, you should still be doing access control, you know, authentication, authorization, input validation, you know, escaping encoding and sanitization, because it's going to you know, get rid of the other issues on the server, like, you know, SQL injection. And it's also important to know that access can still occur through explicitly trusted user data, uh, you know, treat it as expressions. There's also expression injection, and there's still apply libraries, as we saw earlier. So even though Angular element is there, no one uses it, everyone still uses jQuery. Well, you know, some people do, but most people still use jQuery. And as of course, there's still server-side interactions, so HTML entities will encode HTML special characters, but as we saw, Angular expressions are not HTML special characters. But in inclusion, uh, Angular, in person, my personal opinion, is a fantastic framework. It offers a lot of security protections by default. So don't mix server-side and client-side templates. Do not directly use user input in expressions. You know, check plugins for security issues using Retire.js or SNCC, or you know, using what tools you have available. So there's also um, uh, Scan.js, which looks, it's a bit deprecated, but you can use the ESLint plugin. It's a bit deprecated, but I still use it. Um, and embrace the migration from one to four because it's a lot more secure. Thank you. OK, everyone. Thanks very much, Liz. You might be wondering, why am I speaking into this cube thing? Because this is actually a full mic, right? So there it is. You throw it to a person that raises their hand. And then you speak into this little cross here, and everyone can hear you. OK, questions? <laughs> no one wants to speak into this thing. <laughs> I think Christian did. It. Did you have a comment? Question? Yeah. Wow. Um, I got the impre Okay. <laughs> I got the impression that a lot of solutions to the security problems inherent in uh, Angular is a type of whitelisting. <laughs> is that a good impression? I would guess so, because I mean it's on the client, so there's only so much you can do. You can use sanitization, but it offers it by default. But then if you had to explicitly trust data, you can still do sanitization. So you could use like DOM purified, for example. But um, you know, if you want to make sure it's checking for age and stuff, you can still just do a valid, you know, a whitelist approach, um, which I think is you know, it's, it's, it's OK. But there's obviously limitations with that as well. Yeah, it seems to be the resource intensive. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I'm personally not a developer. So all the things I the proof of concepts I make are from a security perspective. I'm not always looking at performance, which is shame on me. I should be doing better. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Raise your hand and I'll give you this cool mic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm supposed to throw it, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, a bit scared to break it. <laughs> what the question? Yeah. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you've got any thoughts around the comparison between uh, Angular and React from a security point in particular. If you are running a 1.x, is it even worth bothering doing the migration to, to later versions of Angular, or do you just jump ship and fly React land? Um, so um, the guy sitting in front of you is more of the expert, React expert than me, so you might want to tap him on the shoulder later. But um, from my point of view, um, I don't think it really matters. Um, but it depends from a business perspective, from, from higher ability. You know, are more people using React, or more people using Angular 2? 
So if you're going to spend migrating, you know, you want to look at it from one, are you going to have to hire developers to be able to do it? Um, but personally for me, I like Angular 2. I think it offers a lot. Um, React is, the attack surface is quite small. You know, you've got dangerous at HTML. You had, you, know, you can still technically use CSS injection. But um, yeah, personally, I'd still stick to Angular because I've spent so much time looking at it. Uh, but again, I think most, most security people are saying, go use React. Yeah, well, so the guys at Riot are like absolutely advocating yeah. Riot games. Uh, I think like David Rock and his team are like absolutely advocating going for React rather than Angular. Yes, yeah, so just wondering. Um, we we had a new guy join the team recently, so I've been pen testing for about a decade. Um, back in the day when XSS was you know like no mitigations and stuff like that, mm -hmm. new guy joins the team this week, trying to explain to him why XSS is bad, and you know it's getting filtered out by the browser and, and all this kind of stuff and. I was just wondering, what's your view and what's the industry view at the moment on the real risk of, of cross site scripting and how do we explain it to clients in terms of, you know, how bad is this? Because I assume for most examples, it's switched off the mitigations in the browser yep. to, to execute. So what are we saying these days to clients as to how bad Exorcist is and, and why? What's the, the scenarios that people can get exploited? In? God, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's that's too, too outside the, the topic then. No, it's not, it's not too outside, uh, outside the topic. Um, so, I mean, it depends on the context. So, if you have things like you know, email encryption that's going browser to browser, the server side has no information about that anymore. It's all being re-rendered in the view. So, that's quite, you know, quite a big attack service for cross-site scripting, because if you can access the secret token or something like that, that's quite bad. Now, um, I, I, always, I truly believe that the browser will be the new operating system, because it's so many APIs are like, coming into it. And you know, mostly everything happens in the browser. Of course, there's now native applications. Um, but you know, of course, you know, once you have access to evil local storage, you know, a cookie which hasn't got protect flags on it, like with client-side frameworks, now you're disabling HTTP only because the framework needs access to certain cookies. People write, you know, JDKs to um, use auth authorization headers and authorization appends through JavaScript. So you know, there's there's a, the attack server is getting bigger. Uh, there's obviously Definitely room for, for improvement, and there's definitely um, you know limitations with you know what people like developers are doing. Um, but um, you know, there's there's tons of things, and I, I think like CSP is very complex. Now to mitigate a lot of cross-site scripting, you would want to do CSP, but it wasn't built for developers. It was built for people who were just defining rules, and you know, that's something that we need to tackle. Sure. So, I don't so know if, that if, the if someone exploits it, it's still really damaging. It's still got a huge future to have a big impact. Yeah, because you can the scenario, do. Like, scenario? Um, I mean, so the scenario is like you know you can do XHR requests through JavaScript, and then you can append. You know, you can still make perform requests on on our, on behalf of the user. You know, you can do um, pay if it's a stored cross site scripting. It affects a lot of users. Um, and you know, for example, you know, you can do you know overwrite the page to put whatever you want. You can redirect them to anywhere you want. You know, it's still, it's, your cross-site scripting is still quite damaging in many ways. Luis, can I also uh, um, comment on that? So the best way to explain to developers is actually to show them, right? So uh, there are two projects that OWASP has, that's WebGoat and Security Shepherd, which are training platforms, which are for free for developers. They actually have very good examples of cross-site scripting, and uh, I think developers will understand it from there. Uh, there is another free um, module called Beef, Beef as in beef, it's available yeah. in Kali Linux. It actually has some very scary examples of cross-site scripting and demonstrates how um, things like keyloggers or a complete takeover of a browser can happen through cross-site scripting. So if you demonstrate that to your developers during your training sessions, I think we'll they will appreciate the seriousness of that vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, this is all will be available. We'll explain to them. So obviously, the key is training, and we do have some free training platforms to explore. Right. I have another question here. Hi, Luis. Um, I'm Raúl Rodríguez from uh, Sulke Engineering. Um, I'm completely new to uh, Angular. Mm -hmm. I just I started uh, getting started like two days ago, Good. and and I was just wondering what sort of process do you follow to uh, discover this type of vulner vulnerabilities. So generally start at the security page. <laughs> but the, the problem when I first started to look into Angular, the security page was blank. There was literally nothing there. So I guess like taking a look at the internals and actually starting to look at the security protections it offers, start, start there and then see if there's any you know, problematic you know, areas with that. And then of course, configuration is generally the most you know, prevalent you know, area which we find where things are misconfigured. Uh, that's an area for concern. And of course, when it comes to JavaScript, 
you know, adding things into sync so you have sources where, you know, like request parameter in Java, for example, or you know, the query parameter or something that can be defined by the user that's a source. And then like in, Java, in vanilla JavaScript, you know, there's syncs, you know, in a HTML, uh, anything in a new function, anything called being called by eval. Like these are all areas for concern and these are things you should start looking at to make sure they're not included in your application. And like things, even things like analytics software, you know, generally they just take all this data and then we just throw a big eval and then send it off to a server. And I've seen quite a few clients that have been, you know, cross-site scripting due to third-party inclusion uh, of JavaScript. Um, nice, thank you. Okay, I think we're short of time. So uh, thank you very much, Luis. If you've got any more questions, you can approach uh, Luis during the break or after the event. Thank you, guys.